Susan Sandanamaker with sunisfuture.net, and we are in Solar Power International SPI 2013 in Chicago, and we're fortunate to have Mr. Carl Rabigo. Yep. And Carl has been in uh, the solar industry for quite some time, and he is all over the places. He's been uh, uh, a deputy assistant secretary of U.S. Department of uh, Energy, and also he has been working with the uh, the Austin Power uh, Energy of uh, Austin, Texas, and he's been the um, um, not only from the regulatory end, but he's had experience with corporate regulatory, and uh, he's just with wealth of experience we really need to tax from. And also, most importantly, I think in 2012, uh, SEPA, the Solar Energy Power Association, actually named the uh, uh, Austin Energy as the public power utility of the uh, of the year. Yes, they did. So mainly due to the use of value of solar. Yes. So we'd really like to ask Carl about this uh, value solar, how it's set up, and how is it compared to net metering. So Carl, can you uh, start by explaining what net metering, sure. which is a very widely accepted uh, form of uh, use for distributed powers yeah. and also residential power. So can you explain the pluses and minuses? Sure. Let's let's start with where net metering comes from. It actually, okay. you know, it's a very old law uh, or it's derived from a very old law, the Public Utility Regulatory Policy Act, mm -hmm. PERPA. Uh, was passed in 1978 and it basically said that uh, among other things it said that customers could self-generate mm -hmm. customers of electric utilities were allowed to make their own electricity and that they would uh, have the uh, the right to essentially I mean through a variety of interpretations so they, they had the right to spin their meter backwards yes. and this is a kind of a foreign concept for the young people because because may, many may never have seen a mechanical meter but in the old days you know the meter was a metal disc mm -hmm. and it got driven in a positive direction by your consumption of electricity um, but if you had a solar system or a small generator in your facility you could drive the meter in the opposite direction now it, it was actually true that in the in the old days you there was a little screw inside the meter that oh, would prevent wow. it from spinning backwards oh, okay. and the original fight for net metering was the for the fight to remove that screw so oh. that they so it could go both ways okay. and the customer could get credit oh, for okay. generating their own electricity mm -hmm. then the idea was that if there was extra electricity that would be exported to the grid the ut the utility had to pay uh, a fair price for that electricity the okay. so-called avoided cost. Yes. So, over it, it was a it's it was and it is a beautiful policy. It is simple. It mm -hmm. tells you that if you spin the meter backwards, you're going to get full retail value for your electricity. Uh, nobody has to do anything fancy. No sophisticated calculations. Uh, easy to implement. It just shows up as a it shows up at your final net meter reading because mm -hmm. it pushes backwards, pushes forwards. The net result is how much you get billed, why it's called net right. net Very metering. Straightforward. So yeah, pretty simple. It ended up getting adopted in about 43 different states. Okay. So for a long time in the sleepy backwater, really, of the electric utility business. Solar was very expensive. Not many people, few farmers and stuff had uh, little small wind turbines, you know, things like that. But basically, it was a backwater issue. Utilities, uh, when they got net metering laws in, you know, when net metering laws were passed in various legislatures guaranteeing this, because some utilities started messing with trying to not to pay fairly or trying to reduce the opportunity or to impose uh, interconnection costs or insurance requirements. Oh, just um, all kinds yes. Of so every now and then they had to sort of visit with the legislature to say, no, dang it, we meant this. You know, customers mm -hmm. should have the right to self generate and they should self generate at retail. Um, so there's been some fiddling around, uh, but it's now pretty much settled and accepted, and we're now in a world where solar is getting very cost effective. Yes, it's dropping. You know. all yes, the time. yeah, they were the, the people who talk about grid parity, right? Mm -hmm. It's like or plug socket parity. They yes. say a lot of uh, states it, have already reached yeah. that. Yeah, so it's right, and and a lot of countries, mm -hmm. and other, you know. So anyway, so solar is getting very competitive, very and now utilities, yeah, now utilities are starting to say that they see a time when this is a threat. The other thing there's, which means it's a threat to their income streams because they always were the guys who made all the electricity and sold it to us with this minor exception. And if this minor exception grows, 
you know, geez, who's going to pay for the power plant? And that's the second part of the uh, utility argument. The, the, the second part of the utility argument is that is who pays for it? You know, if they built uh, a $12 billion nuclear power plant and suddenly customers start leaving the system or using less of the system because they're generating their own Power. electricity, then the utilities uh, have argued, well, that's going to put that's going to put poor people on the hook. I guess should, it's apparent Four we have a rumbling in the background when we talk about the utilities, okay. right? Yeah. You know, uh, they, <laughs> the, uh, they, they're going to say, well, it's going to be left on the poor people who can't afford solar. Mm -hmm. Or so, we're not informed. Or not informed, yeah. or for various reasons, just choose not to self-generate. Because the right, right. to not self-generate is, you know, people argue, is just as important as the right to self-generate. Monopolies mm -hmm. are there to serve everyone. And they'll become more expensive for and those that, who are exactly, on the group. That's the argument. That's the argument. So I was, I happened to be uh, an executive at Austin Energy, the municipal electric utility for the city of Austin. We were pushing really hard for solar. We had about a thousand customer solar installations in the city. We wanted solar to grow. We had a progressive community with, uh, with a strong clean energy focus. And uh, I could see I could see that the perception would grow that the rich people had solar and the poor people were getting stuck with the coal plant. Mm -hmm. That we, we were paying incentives to get customers to use solar because it's still not quite cost effective. And I could see people saying, gee, all the incentives are going to the rich people. So you could, yeah, so you know, yeah, perception often outruns reality. Yes. And. I was Sad dealing with that. Well, we used to say at Austin, you know, sort of the solar is sort of our, our dream and our nightmare. Mm -hmm. It's our dream because it's a clean, All local, uh, just, you know, the, a great power source. Nations, right. Yes. But on the other hand, it's a nightmare because it forces the old utility system to encounter some of these issues. So I've set it all up. There's a couple of other little things that I need to add about net metering, which, which is that, first of all, as I said before, the value that a customer receives when they have a net metering scheme is that their electricity is valued at retail. It right. offsets retail. Mm -hmm. Now, we didn't get to that number through a calculation, and that's kind of unusual in the, in the utility world. You know, you, normally there's a cost study for practically everything we yes, do. Yes, well, everything. Right? I mean, one expects, yeah. yes. Some, and, especially if you're stepping into something new. Right, and we never really did do a cost study to say that net metering, where you get retail value, was the right business proposition. And that means that the proponents, the solar advocates, are at a little bit of a weak point. Because they, they don't really have an analytical basis for arguing that net metering should be at retail. I mean, and I'm an old regulatory geek. I was a public utility commissioner in Texas. I know how rate, makes or, rate making is done and how rates are set. And it's, I, I considered that a little bit of a vulnerability. I will tell you the second thing is that because net metering gives you retail for the consumption that's offset, mm -hmm. but oftentimes the value for excess production is lower, you're actually getting two different prices for the same good. Right. I mean, the solar makes... The, toast, the solar energy can make the toast just as brown, mm -hmm. whether it's working on your house or whether it's excess to your needs and goes to your customer's house. But the compensation that the solar receives can vary dramatically. Right. You know, if your retail rate is, say, 10 cents a kilowatt hour, and your, uh, your excess production compensation rate is, say, 3 cents a kilowatt hour, like it was in Austin, mm -hmm. That sets up a pretty strong dynamic for solar customers to make sure they use every kilowatt hour they make. Mm -hmm. yep. And follow me with this, if they have an incentive to use every kilowatt hour they make, solar customers know when solar works mm -hmm. during the daytime. During the day. So we actually had solar customers shifting their load mm -hmm. to the times when solar was generating, meaning they were increasing on-peak use of electricity. Mm -hmm. well, Energy efficiency was our first priority, and we've got the solar customers who have an environmental ethic actually increasing their daytime use of electricity because it was rational to do that. Yes. So we, we went out and surveyed customers, and we found they would do things like run their dishwasher 
at two or three o'clock in the afternoon when everybody else is telling you, well, please put it off till late at night to save, <laughs> you know, to save on daytime electricity. So that that's that's not smart. You know, mm -hmm. that's sort of a, an, an unintended consequence that's a little bit unfortunate. And it's because under net metering, your compensation for your solar is tied to your consumption of electricity. And people who spend a lot of time in rate making know that when your compensation is tied to consumption, you have a strong incentive to, in to increase your consumption, right? right? So mm -hmm. that's the preamble, a little long and windy, exactly but what we want. okay, I good. Mean, in terms of, uh, so here I am, that. Austin Energy for the first time in 17 years is doing a retail rate case. It, it, because of its aggressive energy efficiency, it managed not to raise base rates right. for over 17 years. Paid cash for all its wow. smart meters, paid cash for a power plant. Uh, that's what conservation can do. I mean, a little aside on energy efficiency, the average residential electric bill in Austin is 20% lower than the average residential electric bill in Texas oh. because of an aggressive pursuit of energy yes. efficiency. And for okay. solar advocates, it's important to know that the more efficient you are, the cheaper it is to solarize your home. And that's only within right? the first couple years, right? You have, you have already discovered 20% difference. Well, that, that, that was the result of 25 years of okay. concerted energy efficiency programs, right. you know, focusing on getting the air conditioners more efficient more green building and building the culture and the ethic around efficiency. And it was very important to us, and like I was saying before, the idea that solar customers would come on and be less efficient because mm -hmm. of the way we were giving them money, yes. it just didn't, didn't square with our ethic. It wasn't culturally right, you know. So, so we're doing a rate case for the first time ever in 17 years, and I went with my solar staff and said, let's, let's, let's go after this solar rate as if we weren't bound by everything we did before. Let's free ourselves, unshackle ourselves from net metering, and pick the best parts of a good solar rate we could put together and make a rate from scratch. Okay. And that's what we set out to do. Now, um, what did we know? Well, we knew that a solar rate should be fair to solar customers, and it shouldn't make them do things we don't want them to do or encourage them to do things like be wasteful in their consumption of energy. But it also has to be fair to the utility, yes. and it has to be fair to the non-solar customers, all those issues that are on the table. Luckily, Austin Energy had actually been paying attention to what solar energy was worth oh. for some years before that. Oh, and I'll, I'll take a little detour backwards, because I didn't have to invent a lot of this from scratch. You see, back about five or six years before I got there, we had actually commissioned a study to find out sol what solar was worth because solar, big solar developers were approaching the utility saying, buy our solar power. And we could do, you know, you, you, we talk about things like having competitive, you know, solicitations, uh, requests for proposals. Well, those will tell you what the cheapest deal is, but they won't tell you whether the cheap deal is a good deal. Mm -hmm. So this is a sort of the important difference between sort of cost and value. We could, we, you know, we could get, proposals from a half a dozen solar companies and tell you what the lowest cost proposal was, but we wouldn't know if that cost was worth it. So we had already commissioned to start examining the value of solar. And what that means is that when solar is generated in the utility grid, it obviously provides energy. It also provides capacity. It avoids the need for more power plants in the future. It's like having a little privately funded power plant on the customer's premises. Very it avoids the need for transmission and distribution because the electricity only has to go from the yes. roof to the toaster, not from efficient. the power plant to the toaster. It, it, is, it doesn't have the risk of fuel price fluctuation mm -hmm. like natural gas natural power, gas, yes. power the most, the most mm -hmm. volatile priced fuel in the entire utility fleet. It's carbon proof and waterproof in terms of worrying about risk of environmental regulations or of water shortages or droughts. Texas is going through a 10-year drought. Wow. All this makes solar more valuable and, we, and it creates jobs mm -hmm. and bunches of other things. So we ask our consultant to look at it and we tried to reach a point, and this is actually a lesson we learned from PURPA, that federal act that I was telling you about. Mm -hmm. We tried to reach the point where the utility would be indifferent. The point where the utility could make the solar electricity at a utility-owned solar plant mm -hmm. and transmit it and distribute it and serve it to the customer, or the customer could do it themselves. And there's a point right there in the middle where we go, yeah, we don't care. Oh. 
And okay. that price, mm -hmm. that price, that value of solar is what they call, the economists call an indifference price, oh. right? Okay. We're indifferent. We're indifferent to whether we make it and deliver it to or you or that you make it and use it yourself. Mm -hmm. And that should be the price we're willing to pay. So the first use we got out of that value of solar indifference price was to benchmark those requests for proposals. And you know, those if, if a company solicited us and said, we're gonna offer it to you for less than we knew our value was, mm -hmm. we win. We're gonna put downward pressure on rates over time. Mm -hmm. Now I'm gonna be very clear about this. If we know what the value of solar is mm -hmm. and we can get it for less, then, that's then we know we will put downward pressure on rates over time. Uh, yes. That's fundamental to this yes. idea. And by the way, I should say that even when you calculate the number conservatively, mm -hmm. There's always a huge bag full of other value that doesn't get rolled in, like the value of, of, of salaries for solar oh. workers that are, get spent into your community mm -hmm. and keep uh, the shops and the restaurants working and causes more consumption of electricity and for less the utility. Cost for having to clean the air. Right, or... right. And all, you know, the avoidance of those environmental, all, the, all those things, we, we, we haven't yet figured out how to get every bit of the value into the formula uh -huh. so we're always comfortable knowing that there's a lot more value out there but even the parts that we do get in again mm -hmm. if we can pay less than the value we're gonna put downward pressure on rates yes. that's how it works and it's kind of the opposite of the way natural gas plants work mm -hmm. right when you think about natural gas plants we pay very little for them up front mm -hmm. But then we pay for more fuel later on. And yes. no matter what the fuel price is, it's the utility go passes that price to us. Yes, and right. it'll always so, be going up. <laughs> so the very first thing we did was mm -hmm. with the value was we just used it to benchmark these proposals. The second thing we did with is when I arrived at Austin Energy, I used it to benchmark rates and rebates. So, you know, we, we were paying a $2 a watt as an incentive. Mm -hmm. I could look at the value of solar, calculate that, and figure out whether that $2 was a good a rebate because when you're in the rebate business you don't want to pay too much rebate because mm -hmm. you'll get an artificial boom market but you don't want to pay so little rebate that you don't get any market at all right there's always a goldilocks thing and the value of solar helps you figure that out and then finally i catch back up to when my team and i decided to start a new rate and with that list of issues that we had before and the potential issues and the perception issues that we had with net metering and I should say the fact that our solar program was pretty successful and we we're getting a lot of demand for those rebates and incentives. And that started becoming an issue when I asked for that in my budget. The idea was that we had was that if we compensated our solar customers fairly, mm -hmm. we could start having a conversation with them right. about them paying their fair share. You see, it's really hard to tell a solar customer who's already digging in their own pockets to spend tens of thousands of dollars on a solar system that they're right. not doing their fair share. Mm -hmm. In fact, it doesn't make sense in their heads because it doesn't make sense on the facts, mm -hmm. right? I mean, they know they're contributing great value. They know they're building a waterproof, drought-proof, mm -hmm. climate-proof, reliable local source of energy that doesn't exactly. need that they know that Sm solar customers are some of the smartest customers you'll ever meet and then to go tell them oh by the way you're, not you're getting <laughs> subsidized when you put twenty thousand dollars down on a solar system How and you, you get a that? and you yeah. get a you know a three or four thousand dollar rebate check mm -hmm. it's not doesn't sound like a subsidy going no, no, from exactly. someone else to them it sounds mm -hmm. like they're subsidizing the utility and by the way, the value of solar calculation says, yeah, they are. Mm -hmm. It says that at retail, they are. Mm -hmm. Quick point aside here. We we'll want to make is, sure that's yeah, this is, yeah, this is really important because, you know, sort of people ask, well, where should the value of solar number be, right? Mm -hmm. Well, let's just compare, right? Now, that value is going to change from it region to region. It could change over time, from... region to region, but the way we calculate it should not. Right? The way we calculate it should start getting more and more uniform. Right. But you use your local you values. Become available right. You use because. local values, but the methodologies should be consistent. Right. And Jason Keyes and I just authored a paper for IREC that sort of lays out all of this methodology stuff. Mm -hmm. But it's you know, it's it's important to recognize that that putting all those values together mm -hmm. um, enables us to really start understanding what's happening in the grid. Right? right 
and understand, and it forces the utility to actually understand how, where their costs come from. Where, what are the most important components that you are using? The ones I've rattled okay. off before. Energy, mm -hmm. capacity, right. transmission and distribution, okay. energy and capacity. Okay. In other words, the day-to-day the -day use of the grid, but also the long-term need to add to the grid, yes. right? Re replace transformers, add new wires. Mm -hmm. So you've got energy from the power plant, just straight up make the toast brown. You've got capacity, the need for future power plants is avoided by having a customer invest in a power plant. Mm -hmm. Transmission and distribution used for those central station model systems. Okay. Fuel price volatility, mm -hmm. the, the fact that, electric, that solar gives you a fuel price guarantee. Environmental benefits, mm -hmm. the regulatory risk, the reduced compliance costs associated with operating solar versus having to operate a polluting power plant. Okay. And increasingly water. 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 Yes, Big that issue. Is. Big issue. Yes, and it's not being valued. It's, we, we need to do better work to value water in our energy system yes. uh, constantly. So anyway, so mm -hmm. we came up with the idea, I'll go back, we came up with the idea that if we compensated our customers fairly, we could have a conversation about them doing their fair share. Mm -hmm. And it turned out that we had a very simple idea. We would just do, we'd change from sort of, if you will, net metering to net billing, still all on the customer side of the transaction. Mm -hmm. But we would credit them for every kilowatt hour their solar plant made at the full value of solar, okay. which is slightly higher than retail because it's a premium product, mm -hmm. right? But we would charge them for every kilowatt hour they consumed as if they had no solar plant at all. Okay. And what that allowed us to do is to make sure that a solar customer could never be accused of not paying for the poles and wires and their nighttime use of electricity or any of that stuff. But at the same time, we could fairly compensate them for bringing a better than average kilowatt hour to the system mm -hmm. and making their own investment and doing their own maintenance and their own insurance and all that to keep that power plant running. It basically came down to we were letting our customers build some of our power plant for us. That's very good. A partnership That's with our a, customers. A true partnership. Yes, yes. So what did you find after the value of solar is implemented? Right. What happened to their behavior pattern? Well, it's it's fascinating. Um, we, it's probably too soon to see whether they shave, change their consumption patterns, mm -hmm. but we saw that the market liked it so much that in Austin they've already reduced the rebate by over a third. Oh, and within they've, what period of time? During, it's now been just a, about a year. Mm -hmm. Yeah, since it went into effect. In fact, the one-year anniversary was October, October 1st. Oh. So they're able to reduce the rebates by a year, by, by a third, and the demand for solar has gone up. They went from 1,000 to 2,500 solar systems in Austin. Oh. So we have a market that runs more without subsidy mm -hmm. because it's got a fair value. And as a matter of fact, I think this will actually help to uh, increase the chance of consumers to stay on the grid rather than off the grid. Exactly. This is, you know, the big di issue that the utilities should worry about is this phrase, bypass. Mm -hmm. That customers will increasingly use the technologies available to them to basically thumb their nose at right. the utility and say, I don't need you. Right. right? And mm -hmm. the smart utility says, they have the choice of either thumbing their nose at me or I can become their partner. Mm -hmm. And the smart utility that wants to survive chooses to become their partner, right? right? And that's, what, that's the way we viewed it. So we didn't think of solar as a nuisance, we thought of it as a resource. Fantastic. Right? Oh, we didn't think of trying that. to pay them the least we could pay them, we tried to pay them a fair amount. Yes. And that enabled us to have, like I said, that conversation where they'd pay their fair share mm -hmm. as well. So in Austin, there's no argument that solar customers are, are, are being subsidized by other customers. And in the long run, it's probably more fair for everyone, not just the consumers, oh, but also uh, the utility companies will be able to have a much well, greater longevity. Horizontally and vertically. Mm -hmm. Vertically, the way you were talking about, the total costs are lower, mm -hmm. 
The utility diversifies some of its costs over to its customers, it therefore diversifies some of its risk, gets a more, more interesting portfolio of generation that includes generation in the places where they serve as well as generation outside. All of that creates great benefit. When I was at Rocky Mountain Institute, we wrote a book that cataloged oh, okay. all that uh -huh. called Small is Profitable. And, we're, and we can realize all those benefits by encouraging customers mm -hmm. to invest in power plants on their roof but horizontally as well, because as the, as the distribution, as RMI calls it the distribution edge, as the distribution edge gets more sophisticated, solar just happens to be the sort of the tip of the spear, mm -hmm. right? What's behind solar now is storage, mm -hmm. which has yes. increasingly become affordable. Or guys like me who have a Volt, mm -hmm. I've got storage on the hoof. I can deploy storage anywhere I can drive my car. Right? Yes. Uh, we've got technologies that allow me to control my air conditioner from my iPhone, mm -hmm. to do set points, to respond to price signals from the utility. All the demand response and energy management technologies are available to me. I can, we can use smart grid technologies to make things more secure. So what I say is behind value of solar are several more S's. Mm -hmm. The value of storage, the value of savings, the value of security, and the value of smartness. Yes. And these are all more complicated than the dumb one-way electron delivery system that the utilities used to run, mm -hmm. but there's a lot of value in there. Yes, you and know? there's going to be so much information required right. before right. you can actually implement this. And we have to understand the cost, and we have to understand the value. Mm -hmm. So going all the way back, shorthand methods are pretty good when you don't have much of a market, mm -hmm. but and what we used to call rough justice, but we can improve on that. And as we gain the ability to do that, we should. Now here's the, here's the neatest thing to tie it all up in a bow. Mm -hmm. What we're finding, and I'm, I'm doing work in Minnesota, Michigan, uh, North Carolina, Florida, Georgia, Louisiana, uh -huh. all places where understanding the value of solar is increasingly important to the utilities, yes. to the regulators, and to the solar businesses. Um, it's not that you everybody has to do a value of solar rate, mm -hmm. but what we do need to do is understand what solar is worth. You know, they, there's a, a bad joke about utilities that says, you know, they understand the cost of everything and the value of nothing. Well, they okay. need to understand the value of this. They need to understand the, understand the value of customer relationships. Mm -hmm. And while we might not do a value of solar rate like I did, what we're finding out, for example, is that net metering isn't a subsidy to solar customers. The analysis shows that net metering actually has solar customers slightly subsidizing the utility. Right. Especially the, as the yeah. cost of solar In some cases more, yes. right? More than, subs more than slightly subsidizing the utility and other rate payers. And going through the numbers, just doing the math, doing your homework, yes. makes for more intelligent decisions. When I was a regulator, they taught us that we were economic regulators. That's what you're supposed to do when you're on a public utility commission. And we tolerate this crazy thing that is a monopoly in our free market capitalistic society because we believe it's supposed to be more efficient. It's more efficient to have one provider of electricity than thousands of providers of electricity. That was the original theory. And with this thing which just America hates, is supposed <laughs> to hate, monopolies, mm -hmm. you know, no choice, was supposed to be sort of managed, I won't say managed, I'll say it was supposed to, we, we were going to make it work by having regulation. Mm -hmm. And they told, what they used to tell me was that the regulator is supposed to be the substitute for competition. Mm -hmm. The regulator by saying, hey, there's these new ideas, have you tried them? They're saying, hey, people are figuring out how to do it for less, have you tried that? Just asking those questions and scrutinizing what the utility does keeps the utility acting as if they had a competitor, mm -hmm. because they don't. Mm -hmm. The question that regulators should be asking today is, have you calculated the value of solar? Mm -hmm. okay. And it's vitally important, because if the utilities assign too low a value to solar, or too low a value to anything else, and too high a cost, then they'll buy or use less of it than they should, mm -hmm. and we all suffer. In the long run. It's really important for people who maybe never see themselves as having a solar plant mm -hmm. to understand that if the utility has a more valuable solar option, mm -hmm. 
and they're ignoring it just simply because they've never done their homework. They're hurting everybody. In Florida, state of Florida, a lot of people do want to use solar. Right. What would you recommend? Let's say, uh, would you recommend for the consumers to start a discussion with their utility companies? Right. And what are some of the questions they should ask the utility companies? The, the regulators are the most efficient way. If they could just sit there and say, we want you utilities to conduct a real value of solar study. We mm -hmm. Just figure it out. You know, now, my advocate friends will say, you can't just ask them to study it because they'll study it and then they'll put it on a shelf. Okay. So, but it, but step one would be if we could just figure out what it's what? really worth. In a place like Florida, it needs it's worth to be a lot. Reevaluated on a regular Re basis. Do it on a regular basis because okay. the technology is evolving and the circumstances are changing. So just open the doors. Mm -hmm. Let's see what's behind the curtain. Come on, you know, let's reveal it. Open okay. your black boxes. Go through a transparent process and find out what it's worth. You'll learn a whole lot about how the utility plans and does its business, and that's worth it all by itself. And where do you think these consumers should go to? to well, obtain these you can values. use your appointed the governor. The governor. The, you got a gubernatorial election coming up in Florida. Mm -hmm. Clean energy and sound energy policy should be an issue yes. in that campaign. Mm -hmm. There, the governor in Florida appoints regulators, mm -hmm. and those regulators are accountable to the public. They're supposed to be representing the public interest when they regulate utilities like mm -hmm. FPNL. Um, their municipal and the other utilities have boards mm -hmm. that, uh, in some cases, they're cooperatives where they're you know you actually elect them, or they're municipal where they're appointed. Those people should hear it loud and clear. It's interesting, by the way, the closer the people are, the more progress the utility is making, right? You've got utilities mm -hmm. like Orlando mm -hmm. doing yeah, really are. good work, they but they're, but those Public people commission. live in the community. They're accountable, the leaders of that organization, the board of that organization is accountable to, to public input. Right. So the, the public needs to make their voices heard on that. And the utilities need to start thinking now about ways to engage in a positive way. The industry, the solar industry needs to be, I mean, they're already pretty well organized in Florida and they need to get mm -hmm. better organized mm -hmm. and let people know that with the growth of the solar industry comes jobs, local jobs, manufacturing jobs, prosper, all those prosperity. other things we've been talking about. So um, it's really, a, it, it would benefit from a grassroots kind of effort mm -hmm. from lifting their head up and looking north to what's mm -hmm. going on yes. in places like even Georgia or mm -hmm. west to what's going on in Texas California, and California. Texas. You know, and stop acting as if they live in a bubble. Uh, yes. And unfortunately, <laughs> it's a very sunshiny bubble with not much solar power. Yes. You know? Well, we have lots of sunshine, right, but, uh, right, the, but I think one of the, probably the reason is the cost Electricity has the not perception of the perception of cost. Yes. It's uh, I guarantee you a value of solar study in Florida would show that solar is still more valuable than the average retail rate that customers are paying, mm -hmm. even with your relatively low rates, yeah. because those low rates are being subsidized by the environment mm -hmm. and by our grandchildren. So, uh, not to mention the national security. Oh, those gosh, are all yeah, great right, reasons. Right. Our it's dependence. Just very important. It should, you know, I mean, as a Texan, I shouldn't mind that Florida keeps buying all that Texas gas, <laughs> yes. you know, but, mm -hmm. um, you know, that's not a good solution for anybody. Uh, we also, yeah. not to mention, we, we continue to, uh, the power company continues to ask to build nuclear power plants, right. and, and we're right. also concerned about that, too. Yeah. Just putting up the economics, mm -hmm. you know, of those options would reveal it if we had transparent, open analysis of the numbers. Yeah. So yeah. you would suggest to ask regular uh, regulators to actually right. look at these values. So the regulators would, would they go to someone like you or uh, let's say? Yeah, I mean, there's increasingly there's experience. a lot of information out there, right? A lot of people mm -hmm. are talking about this. Is there any kind uh, of uh, uh, a site where a lot of these data may be made available to general public? Well, because I'm so involved, I do try to keep a lot of things current on my website, you know, at robagoenergy.com, okay. right? Robagoenergy. Uh, R-A-B-A. G-O-E-N-E-R-G-Y, just robagoenergy.com. Okay. And I tweet on it at Robigo Energy because okay. as because it seems like there's a new study every day. I mean, we yes. just got a new avoided Solar cost <laughs> yes. study from North Carolina yesterday. Mm -hmm. You know, and even that and even the RMI study, which tried to 
account for about 16 of them, had to be amended soon and now is out of date because it's missing a couple more studies. So this is a fast moving field. Yes. Um, the good news is that there, there are experts available. You can see who wrote them. You do need to pay attention to some things. I mean, you know, the, the person who wants to get involved has to do a little bit of homework. Not all these studies are the same. Uh, big yes. surprise. Uh, the studies commission depends on who's funding it. That's it. I was going to just say the commission. The studies commissioned by the utility tend to have lower numbers mm -hmm. than the studies commissioned by the solar advocates, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. I'm biased toward the solar advocates, okay. but uh, you, you, you know, you have to you have to sort of see who wrote it, mm -hmm. what their assumptions are, right? right? You know, some guys, what some of the some of the utility are? studies with that really. Um, they act as if the solar plant were not going to generate electricity in the second, third, out to 30 years. Mm -hmm. They act as if it's only going to generate one year at a time. Well, if you take that approach, you won't give much value to it. Um, it there's some of this utility studies say, well, we only build transmission you know, at 100 megawatts at a time or 30 megawatts at a time. Well, then you're not going to give a six kilowatt system on a customer's roof much credit. In fact, you give it zero credit. Or some utilities say things like, uh, well, we're planning to put a nuclear power plant in place in four years when we need it, mm -hmm. so you're not providing me any capacity value and won't provide me any capacity value. We discuss a lot of those methodological biases in the report that we wrote. You can find that at IREC USA, I -R -E -C -USA mm -hmm. dot, dot org, a okay. uh, nonprofit organization where they, they sort of try to put out impartial information. Or sometimes uh, I think uh, they even require you to have some kind of a um, study before you're able to uh, tie into the grid. And right. There's, so yeah, the and the, and IREC is really good about the interconnection requirements, mm -hmm. insurance requirements, other rules of the road for becoming solar customers. A lot of that is kind of going away, but unfortunately there's some there's some rural co-ops and small municipalities that still have some rules that make it hard for interconnection of distributed generation. Um, hopefully that disappears over time, but unfortunately that's where you see a lot of, most of the big utilities don't create a lot of big problems yeah, for interconnection. Is it possible it's, to obtain some of these data from NREL? I think there's been some yeah, studies on NREL, the, National uh, Renewable the, Energy. There's, uh, NREL has done some good studies, and then there's a, the best place to find out about what's going on in your state, of course, is Desire. The DSIRE oh, yes. website. DSIRE. If you yeah, yes. if you search for that, mm -hmm. you can see up you know what the net metering policies are, what the incentives are in your state. Um, Hopefully, we'll all be across the country. Value of solar under DSIRE. I think it's in the Austin. Everywhere. I think it's in the Austin Energy in, yeah. description for well, yeah for net metering. Hopefully, in all 50 states. Right, right. That's <laughs> that you would go. Be good. There you go. Oh, oh fantastic. Well, uh, definitely, we're looking for a more collaborative, partnership type of relationship. Yes. between the consumers and utility companies. Yes. Uh, in the long run, it's going to be f more fair for everyone and it also would increase the longevity for the utility companies. I think so you're right. I think that's really what's at stake here, that is that a, a energy service providers need to focus on energy. Mm -hmm. You know, and that's what they've really always done. That's what they were always supposed to do. They're supposed to provide us with energy services, not just sell us kilowatt hours. Um, and if and if they have a bias towards service, I think there's a the, you use the exact word. There's an opportunity for collaboration between the, the service provider and their customer. And that will be a much more optimistic future for all of I us. I think so. Well, thank you very much. All right, thank and you very much. I appreciate it. Sun Nunnemaker with SunIsFuture.net with Carl Robigo. Mm -hmm.